My, my name is Ben Cavaliero, and uh, Bruce Lee, the director of the center, kindly asked me to introduce Barry because I have known him for uh, a few years, uh, and uh, I'm sure many of you in the audience also have known Barry or of Barry. Uh, Dr. Popkin is distinguished professor at uh, the uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He has appointments in several departments, but uh, he likes to sign his paper as a Carolina, Carolina Population Center because it has been a baby that he created and developed over many years. But he also has appointments in the Department of Nutrition. And through that angle is that I, I met him and started uh, collaborating with him many years ago. He is an economist by training, although you know, he insists he knows about nutrition, but uh, uh, he uh, graduated from Cornell and had a very distinguished early career on um, economics in developing countries. He lived in the Philippines and many other countries. So by uh, the middle of his career, he always has had a tremendous global experience. So by the point he decided to focus more on nutrition and diet issues, he brought uh, to the scientific field this uh, unique combination of understanding the macro indicators of countries, the food production, distribution, marketing, and also uh, understanding the health effects and how to measure the health effects of, of food intake, food production, etc. Uh, and there are not many people that combine this in, in such a, a very uh, practical way in terms of trying to come up with uh, evidence that uh, supports policy. And we were just talking that uh, one of the uh, gratifying things of his career at this time is seeing, uh, like uh, many of the senior people in our school also, that uh, our work and our uh, publication record over many years uh, had some little influence in policy. Uh, we always wish that it had much more, but nevertheless, it's, it's very good to see that uh, evidence uh, has its weight, but as Al Sommer used to say, you have to be persistent and convince the same people more than once uh, in order to affect change. So Barry is going to speak today about uh, preventive policies in uh, low and middle income countries. And this is uh, a very hot topic right now because we have passed from uh, gathering descriptive evidence to doing some uh, uh, intervention studies to really having enough base of scientific data to orient policy in terms of this critical issue of obesity, overweight in developing countries. So Barry, welcome here. To Johns Hopkins. Hi, uh, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. And I'm, I'm going to have a slightly shorter talk than it was laid out because my plane leaves at six and we're leaving here a little after at four ish to get to the airport. So, uh, what I want to do is try to cover briefly, give you some sense of the dynamics now of global obesity. Uh, focusing on low and middle income countries, not the US, the higher income world, which we all have more of an understanding of. Uh, talk briefly about some of the drivers. And then after using Mexico as a case study for the first country to really systematically tackle in a very detailed way uh, some of the issues of obesity in a country with which I've been working for the last decade on the topic. Then talk a little bit about a number of other countries, and I just had a Bellagio meeting this last summer where we essentially kind of had around 15, 17 countries review what they're doing on that very uh, title of that talk today. So, I'm, and things are moving very fast now, so it's a very exciting period actually, probably more for Latin America, but soon for Asia. So we're really moving to the point where c countries, not ours, but many others are taking very, starting to take aggressive action. I'll talk about that, and then I'll talk a little about the future. Uh, so when we think of obesity, we, of course, we all, many of us, like myself, spent the first 10, 20 years of my life dealing with undernutrition, hunger. I actually wrote part of Hunger in America and went with 
do lead with some of the hearings that we did in the South and other places. And we had Kwashiorkor Marasmus in West Virginia, Mississippi, and others back in the 60s. So it's not so far ago that not only in the US, but around the world, that was our only focus. And it changed here more rapidly, and we began to understand cardiovascular disease was dominant, and we began to see the obesity. It took us a long time to react. But around the rest of the world, we only really started recognizing uh, as, a, as a total group this shift recently. And the shift is going on, and it's actually speeding up. And I'll give you a little sense of that. And it's not only speeding up in the sense that the whole BMI distribution is shifting rightward for adults, but there's some other changes which are quite scary going on. That for the same BMI we're now seeing across many countries, high and low income, particularly women, waste going up. So we are seeing uh, an increasing abdominal and visceral fat, which is also a bad thing. It's a lot more complex when you get to adolescents and kids, and I'm not going to talk about that now. But the reality is I'll just give you some sense. Uh, so what this slide has, and you, you're not, I don't expect you to look at all these countries and even see them, but it goes from high income Brazil to low income. Each of these are nationally representative countries, women of childbearing age from really the last five years except India, which was around seven, eight years ago. Uh, and there for adult women, all measured with the same scales except four or five countries done nationally representative from other data sets. Uh, and they're very good samples. And you see on the right in yellow, overweight on the left and black, underweight, urban on the right, rural on the left. These are just prevalences. To give you an idea of all the countries that have very high prevalences of over and, and where the prevalence of under fits that. The second slide is kind of a regional, taking the weighted average of those for each region in the world. And you see the Middle East is really the leader now. North Africa and the Middle East is really kind of up there with uh, the Western Pacific, if you think of that region where we have but tiny little islands. But these are big populations. This includes Jordan, Turkey, uh, and North Africa. And then you see, in terms of major regions, uh, Latin America is really heavy, both in urban and rural areas. And you'll notice that the rural areas aren't that different from the urban, and they're actually catching up. Now, this is put in terms of an annualized prevalence. What that means is if the, between this period and the previous survey, if the rate of change, and this is a recent period, if the rate of change, let's say 100 million people in the country and 1% got overweight in a year, it'd be 1 million. So that 1% is, is that annualized prevalence per percentage point. And you'll see, I'll, from Brazil, even on the top to others, the large number increasing overweight in urban and rural areas, and you'll see the underweight going down for women. This is just women of childbearing age. It's very different and much more complex for adolescents and for preschoolers. It's half and half, depending on the country, the same kind of trend. But generally, this is a pattern we're seeing. Uh, and I'm not. And this is just kind of the same weighted average. And you actually see that the annualized prevalence is really quite high in, in, in Latin America and still in the Middle East. But what's interesting is the rural areas have really are much higher now. And actually, if I then showed you some other slides, which I'm not going to go into, if I'd showed you here the difference between this period and the previous period, you'd see that the Rural areas are increasing the rate of change, and the r urban areas are reducing the rate of change between now and the period, let's say, from the previous 15 years. And we have enough countries with three to five of these that we can do that. And so that's the first thing. The second point is just very briefly to show you about the shift in the BMI. And I'll just use one country to give you that, and then I'll talk about the other. So this is, I'm just using China as an example. And this is 
quant uh, many countries. These are quantiles at the 90th, 5th percentile. So quantile regression takes a distribution, and it just shows you the mean BMI and how it increased between these two time periods, 8 to 14 years apart in all of these countries for women. So they're overweight, of course, when they're at that BMI level, but you can see the increase moving, moving more to the right, just like we have seen it in the U.S. So this is happening globally in many, many countries across the globe and across the income spectrum. It goes from Egypt to others. I could show many others. Uh, now, this is a very interesting phenomenon. We've got a couple, several different papers, one showing this in Mexico, one in China, and then one in the U.S. and the U.K. And in all the cases, in all these countries, for women, except African-American women, non-Hispanic African-American in this country, the waist circumferences are going up across the whole BMI spectrum for the same BMI level. Here you see it at different ages. For China, at different points of BMI on the bottom so that you see the waist circumference in each case going up. Uh, and this in Asia, where at a BMI of 22, 23, you're already getting hypertension in Chinese and you're already starting to get pre-diabetic or diabetic. This becomes much more cardiometabolically serious. And the same is the case with American, his, his, me, Mexican Americans and also with Mexicans. And we found this in all the countries we've been able to get these data on and looking at trends over time for women. For men, it's, it's true in low-income countries. It's not true in the higher income. Uh, so that's kind of a picture. It's not only we're getting more overweight, it's shifting over and getting more serious. And then on top of that, the weights are going up for reasons we don't know why yet. We're going to have to understand. At the same BMI levels, so that we're getting our weight circumference going up. Um, so next issue is physical activity. Okay, so a lot of the reasons for the decline in overweight in low and middle income countries really rely on physical activity. If you think in 1980 or 1990 and the kind of technology that existed in many of the countries you've visited or know about across the globe, you would understand they were still using old-fashioned plows, they had oxen cart, they were carrying things on their back. It was a very different world. If you went back and saw the little tiny $25, $50 tractors, the sprays, the, the vehicle use, the other kinds of technologies in rural areas, let alone urban, you'd understand the enormous transformation of activity. And what I want to show you here, this is from time use data converted to metabolic equivalent. Look at the U.S. where we started. Now, these data change methods, so forget that little bump. But the point is we started at 250 mets about per day, and we're down. If this leaves out sleeping. If sleeping was included and we were at that level, we wouldn't be moving. But it leaves out sleeping in private time from this. But you can see among the major activities, especially occupation, the big decline, now let's go to China, where we measured much more precisely. Every two years, we asked people, were they lifting, carrying? What were they doing at each job? We did the same from, the eight, from, from 91 to the present. Every couple of years, we've asked that for this 20,000 or so Chinese. And you see this huge decline. And look, now, in terms of Mets, they're down to the, above where the US ended up now, but you can get a sense of this decline that went on as technology has opened up into this country. You can go from 400 down to 200 in that kind of time. This is national. The urban went much further down. It's close to the US. The rural is still higher. But this is the kind of change that's happening across Latin America a little earlier. It's happening across all of Asia, except the few countries that are still, like Myanmar and Cambodia, really mired in in poverty and other complexities, but it's happening across urban Africa and moving in to many of the countries in Africa. It is this activity change is really critical. On the other hand, you're not going to get people to go back and plow by hand and do all the things. You're not going to recover this easy. So it's a very complex thing. And we know how important movement is, and we know we have to get it, but I don't think that this is going to be the solution to obesity in the low and middle income countries, nor do any of my colleagues across the globe. 
we think it's going to have to come from the food supply because to get the activity patterns up enough is really not that easy in, in the worlds that they live in with the difficulties of getting movement and so forth. Uh, so we move to the diet side. Diets have only more recently, really in the last 15 to 20 years, transformed in equally profound ways across the low and middle income countries. And I'll give you just a brief sense. First, I just summarize, I mean, clearly, just like in our country, where 75% of our foods have added sugar in them, uh, in the low and middle income countries, sweeteners are really coming very fast, really fast. If I talk about a country like China, I went there, in 1989, for our first survey, two grams of sugar was what they averaged. Today, they're in the hundreds uh, per capita per day. So we've really moved. They're not quite in the hundreds, but they're moving between 50 and 100, depending on the subpopulation. So we're talking about huge, vast shifts in the way people eat. We're talking about animal foods really changing, having a lot to do with global climate and other kinds of issues and many other questions. We're talking about shifts across the board, across all these points, none very healthy. And we're talking about a food system that's starting to look more like the US than it is any other country. We are talking about modern retailers moving in on food systems. We are talking about farmers no longer selling through middlemen and through multiple processes, but selling directly to the Walmarts and Carrefours, or selling directly to the Crafts and Nestle's and others. And the food system's being changed across the board in really profound ways. And I want to just show you a couple slides to give you a little sense of that. You all know what a consumer package processed food is. It's got a barcode, it's in a box or a bottle. So in two surveys, in Mexico, when we funded with the, with the National Institute of Public Health, the diet survey, we added a question for each food they consume. Did it have a barcode? Was it in a box? Was it processed some? And so on. And look at the percentage of calories in the country. You can see almost 60% of the calories in Mexico come that way already. And this is not the farmer's markets that you think of, the beautiful little markets. We have more farmer's markets in North Carolina than in Mexico today. This is really a different world, and a world that's going rapidly moving towards this. All of Latin America has changed at the same level. Started in the 90s, and, it, and it's continued to accelerate. Then, let's go to China. When I went to China to start with in the 90s, there wasn't a single supermarket. There wasn't a single convenience store. Uh, and only in the last decade, starting around 2000, did we start to see modern retailers, convenience stores, and all that. Already, we have, asking the same questions, but for three days, we have 30% of the calories coming from consumer packaged goods. And it, going up so fast, it's 50% increase per year of the retailer growth in that country. You just can't imagine what's going on. Every village now in our survey, including some that takes two hours to get to by all sorts of complex conveyances, including walking for a half an hour, have little stores in them, little convenience stores or grocery stores. It's just, this is what's happening to the face of Asia, Latin America, urban Africa and increasingly moving, starting to move into rural Africa. This is the new globe. So that's the food system change and it's really important to understand in the context of why we need to do all the things we're doing to start to t address this food system with really large scale kind of policies. Uh, so Mexico was really the first country that had really major leadership and said, we want to do something about this systematically. So starting around a decade ago, they began. I've been involved uh, since then, and so I, I have some sense of, of kind of the details, but I want to just give you a broad overview. The first thing they did was because sugar-sweetened beverages intake had doubled between 99 and 2006, they decided we really needed to create, look at beverages. We didn't just look at uh, that, we did a whole beverage guidance panel that looked at this and wrote, came up with a document that led the government. Then they moved on at the president's level and the whole cabinet, every ministry was assigned things to do around a coordinated effort on a national agreement on nutrition that really dealt with dealing with obesity. and. It, 
big day with the president presenting it and all this other stuff, and, and lots of activities that were prescribed. So this is the beverage that came up with something to cut beverages. Now we'd want to cut it to 100 calories like the American Heart Association from the added sugar, but this was the total thing. It was trying to push water. They, they, the government went in, and, and for 20, around 20 million people get government feeding programs. They put in change from whole milk to 1.5% on the way to doing skim milk, and just a many, many things that they started doing on the beverage side. And you know what's happened today. And this is in yellow some of the key points that they were dealing with as part of their national agreement, really dealing with sugar, dealing with also sodium, because it's uh, hypertension is a very major problem there and something that we wanted to deal with and needed to deal with. Then there was a two-year slug slugging fest between the academics, the Ministry of Health, and the industry to come up with school feeding guidelines that would get rid of sugary beverages, that would get rid of a lot of the junk food, would allow some kind of things by the time you got to high school. It, it, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't complete, but they did get rid of a lot of things in the schools, and this has been implemented across the country. Uh, particularly for elementary and middle schools, it's quite strong and quite complete. It's more than ours in the US, our, our uh, changes in our school feeding and our allowance of, of beverages and, and snack food in the schools, that is. Uh, then one of the things they did was the Ministry of uh, Health, Ministry of Finance, and the FDA said, we need to do something with labeling and then ultimately with marketing. So they decided to do, uh, on each package, we were going to get rid of all the claims on the package and put instead, this is a healthy food or not, based on the amount of added sugar, the amount of sodium, trans fats, saturated fats, and then improving, increasing fruit and vegetables and whole grains in the food supply and kind of calling the healthy foods the one that fit the criteria based on the food group. And then that was going to later be used to, for marketing. If you weren't given this healthy label, you weren't going to be able to market. So it was a really strong package. Unfortunately, then an election happened. We got a very conservative government, an even more conservative Ministry of Health, uh, who had very strong industry ties, and that's kind of been waylaid, but a lot of other things despite that happened. So at the same time, concurrent with the elections, right before the elections occurred, the Bloomberg philanthropies decided they were going to use Mexico as the first of hopefully other countries that they'll work with on dealing with obesity. They, they wanted, they cherry-picked Mexico. They knew it was really ready. They knew it was really working. And, but what they did was they put in money for three things. The National Institute of Public Health, the ACT scholarly side. They put in to uh, civil society to take this one really brilliant, articulate group in Mexico City and have them combine with the 23 other uh, groups across the country to create a, 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 lot, a joint group that would advertise and push and promote in a variety of ways, and they funded a lobbyist. So those three groups worked, and, and ultimately what we, and they wanted, we wanted the, we were focused on a 20% SSB tax, sugar sweetened beverage tax, that was it. Uh, the pressure and the public opinion, because every time anybody would come to the country or they could do anything about it, the civil society groups had the media. The, the, the radios and the newspapers were really for this dealing with the sugar-sweetened beverage because diabetes is a major problem in Mexico and really growing, and they're very conscious. And so the, the, the name for diabetes in Mexico is urino con azúcar, which is essentially urine with sugar in it. And so you know it's quite easy then to identify all the sugary beverages and use that and kind of play on it. And so that was done in a lot of ways. And so the Stat Society and they had the Senate on the side. The Senate was much more left. And both of them wanted 20% tax. The president wanted nothing, but he was forced to come back and say, I'll take a 10% tax kind of in a way, co-opting the 20% pressure that was building. And then, surprisingly, the government also introduced an 8% junk food tax. 
and kind of here's a little bit of the quick history. This is really a year and a half ago. We're talking about October two years ago. And in a period of time, in a very intense campaign, the, the civil society groups, every time a poster would go up, anywhere a billboard that would say something against sugary beverages, there would be one saying against the, the, the advocates trying to tax sugary beverages, saying why people needed their freedom and keep them. We'd have a billboard across the street saying the opposite and talking about diabetes and sugar. And it, and it was really brilliant campaign and counter campaign. The only difference is the TV wouldn't let us get in and, and, and use it because the, the big beverage companies got to them. But the radios and the newspapers were really very much helping a lot in this whole process. And that media campaign really forced the movement along until the president came forward and pushed himself for that 10% tax. And that's kind of how this first major country with a, with a SSB tax uh, happened. And the critical things all combined and were all working together. Every time I, anybody else who had anything to say about soft drinks would come to the country, there'd be a press conference. All the media would be there. They really used foreign and national people of very intensely from the word go. And it was a very effective public campaign. Uh, and so does sweet and diabetes isn't was one of the messages. And, uh, and it just, and, and there were just amazing amounts going on in Mexico City in particular. Uh, and this is the taxes that came out. Essentially, every kind of thing you might think of with sugar added or so salt and fatty and any kind of thing you'd call it is it's tax eight percent in the junk food it's amazing the things without it are are real foods that don't have much sugar or sodium or so forth and um and then there's the tax on all the sugar sweetened beverages not unfortunately sugar sweetened milk or sugar sweetened sweetened yogurt drinks nor 100 percent fruit juice which is drunk a lot in mexico so we don't know how that's going to play out in terms of the health effects of of if people will switch to those or what will happen uh so we're in the midst of working to evaluate that and to 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 go on and hopefully uh find an effect, but we do know that prices went up, and and there are certain messages in the Mexico secret that we've learned that other countries are starting to play with. That we need civil society, we need academics to work with civil society. We can't do it alone. We need the government, and we need also that public support, and we need consumer groups to organize it. Very much the way the cancer societies across the U.S. really were critical in helping to push tobacco taxation back. 40, 50 years ago in our country. So that we learned. We also need to have solid academic evidence, and we were very careful with the civil society that everything they did was really backed up so that whatever they said, it would be really hard for the industry to, and the industry was constantly, at one point we we're gonna have a vote on the SSB tax earlier, and the industry brought in the head of the Federation of, of uh, Diabetes for Latin America, and, the, and, he, and he had just received 20000 the day before he put on his web from Coke. And he came in and plastered this thing about the sugar-sweetened beverages are OK. They have nothing to do with diabetes. Well, luckily, he put this thing stupidly on the web. And the next day, the newspaper show his speech and this. But we had to, it held off the vote for a while, those kinds of things. So they, the industry really tried hard. Uh, and they're still trying to get the tax gone, rid of. But we think we'll keep it, but we still need the data and the results to show. So it was an interesting one. More on other countries and case studies you can find in that last uh, Bellagio Obesity 2013.org uh, kind of site. And there's a lovely website on, on World Cancer Research Federation that really tries to document what many countries across the globe are doing in very short detail. So if you want to know more. And what I want to do is focus um, briefly on some of the key elements in the food in environment and what other countries across the globe are doing. And there's a lot starting. And there's four or five key areas. One area, of course, is prices. And as an economist, I love to to tax the things that we don't want, and I love to subsidize the things we do want to have people eat. And 
We'd like to have trade controls, and I'll talk to you about some problems with that that we've run into in countries, and have, that isn't a mechanism we're able to use anymore for reasons I'll note. Uh, we want to, we'd love to get rid of all the claims on packages and put something on saying this is a healthy or the opposite, this is bad for you. Uh, and we'd like to control marketing and all media. And we'd like to restrict the foods. And I'll give you some sense of what different countries are doing. And I'll talk to you a little about what they're doing on food systems in each of these areas. Uh, and there's a lot starting. There's all, I would bet within another year and a half, I'll have three or four other countries that will be doing a tax of 10 or 20%. And a couple of them, we're talking about taxing grams of added sugar, which is even more effective, or grams of sugar in the beverage. So um, I think that the, the, the taxation issue has gone off. I'll show you some examples of what the Pacific Islands are doing, some good, some uh, hasn't worked out. And, um, and I'll give you some other sense. But so the next one, so these countries all started first by trying to ban products that were being imported. There's something called turkey tails, which none of you probably know what they really are, but you can imagine, that were imported by American turkey farmers into these islands. And they were a popular product that were deep fried, if you can imagine the tail of a turkey deep fried. Well, they banned it in a number of these countries, and, we, and our turkey people took them to WTO and got the government to do it, and boom, that didn't work. So the next, but they could tax, so they could tax them. As long as you're taxing every item in the country, it's legal. But they couldn't, with the New World Trade Organization agreements, it's very hard to use trade the way people did in the past. And so that's one thing we're learning. All of these countries which face overweight, obesity levels of 50% or more, not overweight. I mean, and diabetes and heart disease levels that are, are, are out, out of this world in terms of, they're all starting to do things, not enough, but they're each starting and they're moving forward and keep adding every year more, more items. Uh, there's been a lot of countries interested in getting rid of claims or at least putting something on a package in the front that's very clear that says it's either a healthy product or an unhealthy product. More countries have gone for the healthy product approach, which is what our Institute of Medicine recommended we do here. Uh, part of it's been, it's easier to get past. Industry is less adverse to that than they are to you saying this is a bad food. Uh, and partly because it can incentivize industry to make clean up their act, cut their sodium, cut their added sugar, cut their saturated fats or whatever that country deems and increase whatever they want, like whole grains and so forth. Uh, our food industries of the globe can do anything to food if they really want to. Uh, then there are countries, Ecuador, now Peru, which I don't note here, but it's just coming in, Chile, all tried to put something on saying excessive sugar, excessive sodium, something like that, and I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, also, Ecuador's done a number of other things. Chile had this program they passed that they didn't get implemented in time, and then the attorney general kind of put a stop to it, and the political process stopped it. But they were going to also use the same items that were bad with one of those points I mentioned, and they, were gonna, they couldn't advertise them. So anything that they thought was junk food or unhealthy food would, could no longer be marketed, uh, which would have really been quite wonderful. Uh, except for Mexico, very few countries have talked about trying to get rid of the claims and all these funny claims that you see out there on, on items. But, uh, and now a few countries are talking about doing front of the package labeling and also combining it with at least a couple I'm working with, with controlling marketing and using it what to tax and not to tax more. So it's a, it's a kind of happening. This is what was Chile had worked, had all set to implement, and just before they got the implementation ready, and the law had been passed and everything, and then the attorney general got, you know, some who knows what happened, and boom, it got stopped. The same thing happened for a different kind of marketing syst control system, much more comprehensive in Brazil several years ago. Uh, so we've had a lot of problems with big food and big beverage in dealing with uh, these implementation issues across many countries. Peru has a very strong law. They're getting ready to implement. 
industry hasn't put up the, the amount of fight there, uh, partly because of the politics of Peru, and I suspect that will happen. Uh, there's a number of other countries in Latin America and Asia now moving in the same direction. So this, this in general, it seems to be the way the countries are more and more think starting to go, which I hope, because the marketing part we haven't tackled really very well. Outside of France and Scandinavia, no country has really done much on that. Uh, and let me move on. Uh, school, schools, we've got 20, 25 schools actually across the globe, systems that have banned soft drinks. Uh, eight that have banned juice as well. It, it's, and these are some of the low and middle income countries that have done it. Some have been partial, not done everything completely like Mexico and Thailand and others have done a much better job. Uh, school marketing is pretty much banned in almost every one of these countries I mentioned and all, many more. So all those posters and other kinds of things that used to happen in schools in many, many countries that I've worked in and seen are no longer there. Uh, I've mentioned Mexico. Uh, I'll talk about <laughs> Brazil, which is a very interesting case uh, below. And so Chile is really, again, a poster child, but a child that really had a brilliant approach. And they had laws passed, and it took several years, and major global as well as country efforts, led by some scholars working with a couple of very a strong senators that really wanted this. And they, they, they were doing not only marketing controls, they were doing a small tax, but they were also doing uh, the labeling that I mentioned. And, it, and, and then it got stopped. And it's really quite sad. Brazil was the same thing. The law was already being implemented. And then it got challenged in the courts, and the attorney general didn't fight it, just stopped. Again, obviously money involved, and, and, but we don't quite understand all the details. Nobody's ever been able to get to the bottom of it. Um, then we come to what we think of as food systems. And I'm not talking about all the way down to agriculture, but except in the Brazil case, because in the Brazil case, they did two things. A hunk of the food had to come from small local farmers going to school feeding really a wonderful employment generation, political generation thing, and a lot of, and 70% of it had to be real food. Never evaluated, no idea what went on with it, but we do know it was implemented. Uh, Singapore did something, I, I don't know if you know, but if you go to most of Southeast Asia, you'll find that people eat a lot of their meals outside in these very cheap little stalls. Well, Singapore put them together in centers so that they could then work with them. We call them hawker centers, and they put them all over. So they could make them more sanitary, but they could also work with them on things like healthier oils, cutting down the amount of fat, doing a whole lot of other things with it. Hasn't happened elsewhere, but it's a very interesting model. Uh, of course, it's a smaller country, and, it has a, and it's a very high-income country, and so it had the resources to do that. Uh, and. The, there's, the kinds of things that are happening in our country are really not happening in other countries. The farmer's markets push back to real food and all that. You may hear and read about it with some scholars, but it's just the opposite is going on in general. And uh, really very little's gone on dealing with the retailers, and very little's gone on dealing with the fast food restaurant sector, uh, except for Singapore. It's a, it's a, kind of disappointing yet that we haven't started to tackle those because in a lot of countries, there are a very large proportion of the diets. Uh, then we move. The only country that's really doing a very systematic, really in-depth education is Thailand. Thailand is a country that got rid of HIV, got rid of, got family planning instituted, did, got smoke tobacco bans far earlier than any other country in Asia, or Africa, Latin America. So it's always been up at the head of the front curve on, on things. And now they decided, just in the last year and a half, that they have to deal with obesity, because it's one of the highest in Asia. And um, so they've started with this, and they're going to move on. They're in the midst of planning a whole lot of macro kind of efforts, and I'm hoping that we'll end up having them as one of our poster children. But one of the things they focused on is sweetness and the waste as kind of a way there 
and, and, and as you understand, most Asians as well as Indian populations in Latin America are much more sensitive at lower BMIs and, 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 to, and much more abdominal fat and much more sensitive to cardiovascular problems earlier in the game. So it's a very important thing to be focusing on the waste and having people look at that as a thing to control. Uh, so in summary, we're getting a lot of countries beginning to tackle in low and middle income world, whereas very few in the high income world have done much systematic. England started under the previous government, uh, but it ended with the new government completely, pretty much most everything, except a few voluntary efforts now. Uh, but we're starting to see in a lot of low and middle income countries. And um, my goal is in some of these countries that that standard they create for front of the label profiling, they use for taxation and subsidies, and they use it for marketing controls. And a few countries are moving that way, and we really have to deal with all those levels, if, if not more. And so, but we're beginning. We're really beginning to see pieces come together, and that's really, excuse me, that's the end of my pre talk and open for questions. Or comments, or you may leave. <laughs> or I may leave. <laughs> Over on the right. Barry, thank you. Every time you talk, you turn us all into ambassadors for this cause. Um, in South Asia, Rural South Asia, we figure there's 20 years before it really becomes a, a major problem. And you see the curve starting to go up. What are your, what's your prescription for rural South Asia markets? What Keith is talking about is the epicenter for undernutrition, chronic undernutrition among women, adolescents, and children. It's where two-thirds of the low birth weights in the world occur. It's where kids are, are stunted and where the biggest amount of acute malnutrition in the world exists. And it's where adolescent girls are really thin, so the intergenerational transmission of all of this is very serious. And part of the prescription, I think, is dealing with adolescent girls. We're going to have to deal with a multi-generational issue. And there are starting to be, both in India and in South Africa, some studies and intervention trials trying to look at just that issue of dealing with adolescents to get them better so that the kids grow and have a healthy height growth during infancy and, and up to several years so they're on the right trajectory. Because right now, uh, half of those, uh, two-thirds of those people that are kids that are born in South Asia really are on a bad trajectory. That if they do gain weight, they're really going to be very, very prone to central adiposity and to cardiovascular disease. So it's, it's the center of what we call kind of this intergenerational early developmental origins problem of, of chronic diseases. Really, the epicenter is in South Asia. And it's not just India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, but more India than any place. Hi, Barry. Um, so it's great to hear you talk. I've been citing your papers for a while. Um, my question relates to the determination of what's a healthy food and what's an unhealthy food. I think we've seen a lot that, for example, saturated fats are not, not as bad for us. Low-fat diets are more associated with increased obesity. So is there any concern of what are these uh, determinations based on and you know, what happens if the determination is wrong and we're we're more promoting foods that are will increase right, capacity. right, right. It's kind of like the low fat, high sugar kind of period that America went through, when the diet guidelines said both control refined carbs and increase, but the message the industry used was low fat, and they added a lot of sugar, and. This is a real, well, the saturated fat question is not resolved. And there certainly are some bad saturated fats, and there are some that aren't as bad. And there's enormous controversy whether the one review that raised this claim was done right. And, and so I think that remains a long way before we're ready to deal with that. But we pretty much have a consensus on sugar and beverages. We reasonably still have a consensus about refined carbohydrates and things that come through our system quickly as being unhealthy for us. But you're right. 
We know protein is more satin, but we're, we're it's ultimately for obesity, it's partly a calorie issue, but it's, and it's an energy balance question, but for health in general, it's the quality of our diet. And in our country, our kids are having two thirds what you would call junk food if you saw what they're eating, high in sugars and saturated fat. So we have a pretty horrendous diet. And unfortunately, our diet's being transported not by American companies only, by local companies and global companies and all the above across the globe. All right, just a continuation on that theme. Do you have any sense from your regional data where uh, excess calories are coming mostly from fats versus from sugar? A, the low and middle income countries are very different than the high income countries. While in our case, carbohydrates is our biggest consumer. Carbohydrates have been going down across all the low and middle income countries as they brought in much more fat. Vegetable oil exploded between the 1990s and the 1980s and the present in low and income countries. It's a cheap way to increase the quality of your diet. And then all of a sudden in a country like China, 30% of the calories coming from fried food, it went from almost none of the population to, to three-fourths. So we're seeing Frying and oils being a driver in all of these countries I mentioned when I think about there. So that's kind of one issue, but how much of a driver is that on obesity and how much to refine carbohydrates? And what we know is that we've now got to change this food system and get some healthier things, and we got to get rid of frying if we can, and that's not going to be easy. So there's a, there, I don't think it's, I think the, the driver on getting obesity was really the activity and, and the huge decline that happened really quickly and people not adjusting their diets. And now the new driver is the food system and the modern system. And so that's, it's how we're not going to get them back to food. They're not gonna, we're not going to get farmer's markets. We're going to have to find a way to get them to eat and buy in some way more real food and healthier packaged food. And it's, it, this is not a simple process, as you know, what the global food industry is doing, and you know what it's doing to agriculture and doing to eating consumption of real food. And the trends I talked about are only accelerating everywhere. And so I don't think it's a matter of putting your finger in the dam and saying, let's go back to beans and rice and, and making tortillas by hand and having them be really whole grain and healthy, I think we're going to have to figure out working with the systems that are ways to change them. I, unfortunately, I'd like to just go back to have everybody eat the way I do and go to farmer's markets and cook real food, but that isn't going to happen. Time for one more? Yeah. Richard Jackson, UCLA. Great talk, uh, Barry. Um, so the tobacco industry and the tobacco tax really worked. But the tobacco industry didn't fight the tax as much. What they wanted to use the money, and they co-opted the physicians of California to support that money going to medical care, particularly for victims of tobacco, and uh, aggressively opposed any anti-tobacco advertising uh, powerfully. And I think it's very important that when this tax money comes in, it really be used for the health education, health promotion side, and not for medical care, I like your comment. Right. And so in Mexico, we had the advantage for the sugar sweetened tax of working from the beginning to push that we wanted that tax to be used first for water in the schools, which was a potable water in the schools, and second for our public health program. And they've already dedicated about half of it that way. We're monitoring it very carefully. But the junk food tax was a financial tax. And to, just to get money for the general fund, and we had nothing to do with that, and that just came in on the Ministry of Finances, uh, piggybacking on the concern about health and just want, needing money. So um, yes, I agree with you. And increasingly, in every country that's talking about doing taxes, that is what they're talking about, right up front. Uh, and, and you're absolutely correct about our country and what happened in some cases. Barry, uh, the story you're telling is one in which you're trying to make interventions uh, targeted to 
uh, the traditional channels that we're used to in public health through, through ministries of health uh, and through sort of the public health channels, where industry is consistently um, uh, opposing and um, upending what it is you're trying to do. Uh, I wonder if you sort of comment on, but, but what industry is doing, obviously, is increasingly uh, a central driver to the, to the global picture. What are the prospects of, uh, of targeting industry and intervening on them and getting uh, a changing their behavior to try to, uh, so that it's not like doing public health and then having industry undermine it, but figuring out, making industry itself the target of the intervention and trying to get them to be part of the solution. Uh, some of these topics like the front of the package profiling has actually split the industry and there are companies that support it and we're learning to to try to do that when we can uh, and the problem is that in general the food industry has been this anti-regulatory if you open the dike the dam will burst and you know it'll, the, the the first little leak will lead to the kind of the whole bursting of regulations and a million things happening. And that's their fear. And so in general, that, that it's hard to get that crack. But uh, that's one thing. But secondly, the other option is let's have a Coke boycott. We had a Nestle boycott 40 years ago that was terribly effective and enforcing some codes on the world. The problem is this, is a, this industry is so much bigger than anything we've ever tackled before. But we're seeing, I'm starting to see a lot of countries say, we can't afford not to. So my gut sense is it's gonna be, instead of like tobacco, where we started, and it was a long time before we got Asia, Africa, or Latin America to touch it. I think in this case, we're starting to get countries that are so desperate because of the healthcare costs and the health costs that they're doing things. And it may very well be that they're gonna lead and we're going to follow. And uh, I, even despite the politics, I am seeing countries just doing it now. And I've just been in a series of meetings in Asia with four countries that are going to just take on some of these things. They're just, gonna, they're just moving it through. And so I, I have some optimism for a subset of countries. Then how that will lead the food industry. Will they then say, like they did, if you remember with the national restaurant labeling, thing with the fast food labeling and that, that Bloomberg started, then five or eight other counties and cities and states did it in this country. And then the Restaurant Association went to Congress and said, we need a bill. We need a national law so we can have it straight so we're not, we're not, we can't go crazy. So what I'm hoping is that this kind of pressure will ultimately lead us to get uh, something where global industries will support us. Not necessarily local ones, but that will lead to breaking the path, because they can sell anything. They can sell water as well as they can sell Coke. And so uh, I'm hoping that that's one potential that will happen. On the marketing side, it's a tricky one. And, but it's, it, it's starting, and that's all we can do is keep that battle, because I don't see a way that they're gonna, I don't see that we're gonna have the resources to boycott enough of them. We need food. And the way it, the way that moving in villages across Africa and Asia, it's 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 like this epidemic, as you talked about it earlier, uh, just spreading uh, as the system expands. And so, uh, this is a this is a very complex issue that I don't think can be solved except by countries doing things to intervene against the system or control it. Very much appreciate your traveling up here to uh, Johns Hopkins.